Hello everyone, I am the Meta Kirby and welcome to my channel The Commander Timer. The Commander Timer is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Halloween format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews under the deck text. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander from All Will Be One, Grass Unstoppable Juggernaut. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It will really help out the channel. But the very best way you can help support your channel is with my Patreon. There are plenty of perks for being a patron such as early access to certain videos, exclusive deck text, gifts, and more. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing which also helps out a lot. I put out a video every Monday so you don't want to miss out. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tavern community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Grass is a 7-5 artifact juggernaut for a generic. This alone makes it a 3 turn clock. If that weren't enough, it and all juggernauts you control can be blocked by walls. While that might seem like a cute ability, it also forces all juggernauts you control to attack each combat of Able. That's because Graz turns all of your other creatures into 5-3 juggernauts along with their other types. This ability is crazy and aims to make a very aggressive deck. Sure, it's going to be difficult to keep up blockers, but that's something we can deal with later. The point is that, even though Graz costs a whopping 8 mana to cast, it's meant to be cast and then potentially end the game with a very huge army of 5-3s. And how are we going to get those 5-3s? Well, how about creating as many small tokens as possible to then turn them into 5-3 juggernauts? The deck aims to take as many tokens as possible. One way is for free thanks to enter the battlefield triggers on cards like Thunderhawk Gunship, Clown Car, Enchanted Carriage, Mirror Battlesphere, Precursor Golem, and Canoptic Scarab Swarm. While these cards are included mostly because they create tokens for free upon entering the battlefield, they are useful on their own. Clown Car, Enchanted Carriage, and Thunderhawk Gunship being vehicles save them from having to attack each turn. That way if we needed a bigger blocker, we can crew them and have them at the ready. The Gunship is especially useful since it gives all of our attackers flying, potentially providing a game-ending alpha strike thanks to it. Canoptic Scarab Swarm is amazing at dealing with graveyard decks since its token generation depends on what it's exiling from the graveyard. Those tokens also fly, so creating a ton of 5-3 flyers is something to scoff at. The final two are mostly for creating tokens, but since the deck has other ways of creating mirror, the battle seal has the potential of dealing even more damage. The golem is 9 damage on the board for 5 mana without Gras, but with Gras, it's 15 damage on board for 5 mana. Captain's Claws, Inquisitorial Rosette, Sigiled Sword of Valoran, and Staff of Titania are all equipment that create tokens on attack. While they're useful on their own for being able to consistently create cheap tokens for no mana, which is great. With Graz on board, we're creating 5-3 tokens that are potentially also attacking. If that weren't enough, the tokens created by the staff are forests as well, so they help with accelerating the deck too. But we'll see the deck's mana acceleration soon enough. The Rosette and Sword creating tokens that have Vigilance is one way to help us keep up blockers. Diamond Kaleidoscope, Mirror Turban, Nusus Engine, Retrofitter Foundry, Sarpedium Empires Volume 7, Snake Basket, Summoning Station, Throne of Empires, and Trading Post can also consistently create tokens at the cost of mana and or tapping. Granted, this is not that efficient, but the deck aims to slowly but surely build its token army to make them huge once we get grass. Our options aren't many considering the deck is colorless, but with all the cost-reducing effects in the deck, most of these spells are going to be as cheap as possible, maybe even free. So we can at least get some efficiency there. Some of these artifacts also provide other bonuses as well, such as the Kaleidoscope letting us sacrifice Prism tokens for mana, and Trading Post being a Swiss Army Knife type card. Mascot Exhibition and Skittering Invasion keep it short but sweet by simply being sorceries that create a ton of tokens in one motion. Skittering Invasion can also be a way to bank mana by creating Eldrazi spawns, but its main function is creating 5-5-3s five, five when we have Gras in play. Field of the Dead, Springjack Pasture, and Urza Saga are lands that can either get us tokens by activating and tapping or via landfall. There are enough lands with different names to trigger Field of the Dead more often than not. The best thing about Urza Saga Construct Token is that the plus one plus one ability is on the token. So while it's going to already be huge in a mostly artifact deck like this one, if it becomes a 5-3, it'll be 5-3 plus one plus one for each artifact we control, which is insane. As a bonus, we can also use this saga to cheat in an artifact of cost 0 or 1 from our library right to the battlefield. There aren't many artifacts that are immediately target for it, unlike Inventor's Fair which is also in the deck. The deck doesn't have many combo pieces that are dire to acquire, but as we'll soon see, getting immediate access to a couple of specific artifacts will spell doom for our opponents. It's an amazing land here. Speaking of lands, Ikmak Nexus, Blink Mach Nexus, Mishra's Factory and Mutavolt might not create tokens, but they become creatures without taking up slots in the deck. For just one mana, each of these lands turn into a small creature. However, thanks to Graz, they turn into 5-3s that retain their qualities, 
whether flying, infect, etc. Inkamok Nessus is especially dangerous when becoming a 5-3. Any opponent without any pertinent blockers will die in 2 combat steps, from poison counters. These lands are also great at being creatures that won't have to attack via Grass's stipulation if they're just lands, so if we needed blockers we can opt to not animate them during our turn and instead keep them at the ready during our opponent's turns. Another way of doing this is with Karn Silver Golem turning non-creature artifacts into artifact creatures all for just 1 mana each just like those lands. Being able to animate any artifact for just 1 mana is absolutely busted in this deck. It can allow us to either swing out and kill all opponents in an even larger alpha strike or keep up non-creature artifacts as potential blockers. Plenty of times when testing this deck have opponents lost track of Karn's ability and swung into my quote unquote blockerless board only for me to animate artifacts and kill their attackers in blocks. If that weren't enough, if you're forced to block with Karn, you could give him minus 4 plus 4 if he becomes blocked when he attacks, making him a 1-7, which is quite helpful at keeping him alive most of the time. Speaking of keeping our board alive, if we're forced to attack with our 5-3s that are untapped and able to attack, we might lose some of our creatures in combat. Fear not, the deck is running Darksteel Forge and Eldrazi Monument to give our creatures indestructible. Well, the Forge does it best since it gives indestructible to all of our artifacts, which is most of the deck. While the monument gives indestructible, it also gives plus 1 plus 1 and flying to our creatures, making it even harder to block them and making attacks more effective. The sacrifice clause it is even that problematic since the deck has so much token production. Microsynth Lattice is also included to make use of Dark Seal Forge for all of our other non-artifact permanents, which aren't many. Plus, if we're creating non-artifact creature tokens, this turning them into artifact combos amazingly with Dark Seal Forge. These two artifacts are definitely key targets with Inventor's Fair. The deck is also running Unwinding Clock which pairs amazingly with Mycosynth Lattice. With the clock we essentially have a colorless Seedborn Muse effect allowing us to untap all of the creatures we attack with, giving them pseudo vigilance. But also all of our mana sources, lands, and artifacts that require tapping to activate and create tokens. This combination is incredibly backbreaking. However, not as much as with Karn the Great Creator. Having Karn out with Mycosynth Lattice is essentially winning via opponent's scooping. If this method of winning is not your style, you can omit Karn from your deck. However, keep in mind that both the Lattice and Karn are still amazing in the deck on their own regardless if they're together or not. Karn lets us recover artifacts that have been exiled as well as animating a non-creature artifact with his plus one ability. Akromo's Memorial and Coat of Arms are some more epic artifacts to tutor for with Inventor's Fair. The keyword soup granted by the Memorial is a quick way to end the game with an army of weenie tokens turned 5-3 Juggernauts. Coat of Arms gives an epic pump since Gross turns all of our creatures into Juggernauts which is absolutely busted. Just make sure you don't cast Coat of Arms until you've first eliminated the tribal players from your game. Champion's Helm, Commander's Plate, Lightning Greaves, Swift of Boots, and Whisper Soul Cloak are more singular protection, specifically for Graz, since it is an 8 costed commander after all. Giving it Hexproof, Shroud, and or protection from all colors definitely goes a long way. So much so that Brass Squire is included in order to be able to attach these to it at instant speed. This can also be used to equip the previously mentioned token creating artifacts at instant speed too. Or equipment like Conqueror's Flare. Since the deck is very aggressive, last thing we need is someone overloading a Cyclonic Rift during our turn when we're attacking. Fortunately, having this equipped to any creature prevents anyone casting anything during our turn. Since the deck does create some colored tokens, the creature could even potentially get the pump too. Speaking of casting spells during our turn, Cavern of Souls can also help prevent our commander getting countered. It literally doesn't take up a slot on the deck and gives us the guarantee of no one countering our 8 mana commander. Not of this world and Null Brooch can also help us by being counter magic themselves. Believe it or not, there are a handful of counter spell effects in Colorless. Not of this world can be cast for free against anything targeting grass, while Null Brooch is a repeatable negate for simply 2 mana tapping and discarding our hand. This is great when we have an empty hand, but still good to have when we really need to counter that board wipe or other disagreeable dot creature spell. Tomb of the Spirit Dragon helps protect us somewhat by protecting our life totals. It doesn't take up a slot on the deck and is definitely worth including due to how many colorless creatures this deck is going to have and create. The life gained is not negligible. The following cards are needed by every commander deck which are the decks card advantage, interaction and mana acceleration. Introduction to Annihilation, Scar from Existence, Spine of Ishsa and Unstable Obelisk is the deck's own spot removal. Unfortunately, spot removal in colorless is quite expensive, but at least the deck has plenty of ways of reducing costs and accelerating mana, which we'll soon see. Carnal Liberated is another expensive removal piece, but at least it's something we can do multiple times throughout the game. His ultimate is not something we strive for, but at least exiling a card each turn is definitely enough useful for the mana cost. All this dust is the most backbreaking effect of all, since it leaves us almost entirely unaffected. Resolving this in the mid to late game is essentially game over. 
especially when we have Graz and a full board of 5 threes ready to swing in for the win. As for those previously mentioned cost reduction effects, the decks running Cloud Key, Foundry Inspector, Joyous Familiar, Microsoft Golem, The Immortal Sun, and Ugin the Ineffable. Obviously, we're choosing Artifact as the mode for Cloud Key. Joyous Familiar also has the added bonus of reducing the cost of legendary spells, so that means we can cast all of our Planeswalkers for less. Speaking of, Ugin is absolutely crazy here, even with just his static ability. Granted, the Immortal Sun nonbos our own Planeswalkers too, but Ugin and Karn have static abilities that won't be affected, so we're still relatively fine. Plus, it also draws us extra cards and further pumps our board. However, these all pale in comparison to Microsynth Golem. While it does cost a whopping 11th mana to cast, it having affinity itself means being able to cast it for practically nothing. Then all of our other artifacts will cost practically nothing, especially our commander. Wayfarer's Bauble, Navigation Orb, Burnished Heart, Canoptic Wraith, Sword of the Animus, Sword of Hearth and Home, Journeyer's Kite, and Monument to Perfection are the deck's ways of generating land-based mana acceleration. The first four require sacrificing themselves as part of their cost, but at least the Wraith is unblockable, meaning that it's great in the early game to get us basic waste and great in the mid to late game for being an unblockable 5-3 Juggernaut Wraith. Sword of the Animus and Sword of Hearth and Home are even more amazing equipment for the deck. Hearth and Home is even better than at first glance since it pumps, gives protection from two colors not in the deck, plus blinking a creature means having it returned untapped for potential blocks, or blinking a creature that creates tokens upon entering the battlefield. Journeyer's Kite and Monument to Perfection don't put the land onto the battlefield, but getting it into our hand at least guarantees we never miss our land drop. The deck is running 12 copies of Waste, so we have plenty of basics for all these basic land effects. You can adjust this amount as your deck requires, whether more or less. The deck is also running Terrain Generator to not only play extra wastes from our hand, but also play the wastes gotten from these two artifacts, or to drop extra lands as we draw into them. As a bonus, Monument to Perfection can also be used to get Locust Lands, of which the deck is running both. As of making the video, these are unfortunately the only two we have access to. But at least, this means we get a land that can tap for 2 mana. Speaking of, the deck is also running Ancient Tomb and Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, which will always tap for mana unlike Temple of the False God. But if you don't want to run Ancient Tomb, you can run the Temple instead. Some more multi-mana lands the deck is running are Urza's Mind, Urza's Power Plant, Urza's Tower, and Urza's Workshop. While we ideally want the first three as often as possible, even if we were to never get the Trifecta, they're still going to tap for mana without entering tap, so they don't take up a slot on the deck. Best of all, Urza's Workshop doesn't care about which Urza's lands we control, as long as we have others. And recall that the deck is also running Urza's Saga. So the Workshop has the potential of tapping for 5 colorless mana. Blink Moth Urn and Soul Ring are the only mana rocks in the deck since Colorless now has access to land-based ramp thanks to Waste being of the basic super type. That being said, it'd be folly to not run Soul Ring here. Although if you had them and wanted to run them, you could definitely run rocks like Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, etc. to make it even easier to cast Gross. But when testing, I found that the deck did well as it is. While Blink Moth Urn has the potential of helping out opponents as well, this thing will always give us way more mana than it would our opponents. Plus, it only works as untapped. That means that if we animated it and attacked with it, it'd be tapped for all of our opponent's turns, but then untapped for our own main phase. Keep that in mind for that pro gamer move. Lastly, we can achieve wins if we run out of gas. Thus, the deck is running Arch of Oraska, Bonders Enclave, Seagate Wreckage, and War Room to help us draw cards without taking up slots in the deck. Same with Endless Atlas, Eye of Vecna, Idol of Oblivion, and Mind's Eye. But these aren't free like the lands. There aren't many options in colorless, but these are still amazing anyways, even finding themselves in other decks with colors such as white, red, and red-white decks. The artifacts can especially be even better given all the deck's cost reduction effects. This view is just an idea of how to build around Gras Unstoppable Juggernaut. It might seem like this is a tribal commander, but it turns all of your creatures into juggernauts anyways, so you don't need to run any. This is why I chose to try and get as many small creatures for as cheap and consistently as possible in order to then have an overwhelming and potentially game-ending board once Gras enters the battlefield, so that that can hit very hard and win out of nowhere, or win piece by piece since Gras is a 3-turn clock on its own and less if equipped with the goodies in the deck. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me, and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Meditator Kirby, and happy brewing.